Hi. So in this video, we'll talk about subspaces, bases, dimension, and rank. That is uh, maybe the most important section of this chapter. And we're going to get a lot of very important fundamental ideas in this section. So this section actually introduces perhaps the most important ideas in the whole book. We have already seen that there is a kind of connection between geometry and algebra. For example, uh, as you know, for example, let's say x plus y is equal to 5. That is the geom uh, algebraic or the expression that shows us connection between x and y. And also geometrically, we can describe this relationship by drawing a line in the plane. And uh, actually, so there's a connection between this geometry and uh, what is it? Algebra. This is sometimes to understand or get a uh, deeper intuition about some kind of algebraic concepts. We need to get some help from geometry. So we need to use geometry so that we can visualize what we are actually talking about sometimes actually to generalize or go deeper in a certain concept we need to use the power of algebra so we can use, often use geometry intuition and reasoning to obtain algebraic results and the power of algebra will often allow us to extend our findings well beyond the geometric settings in which they first arose because as you know uh, okay, so one dimensional space, we can just visualize this, draw a line, right? And uh, on the line, what can we do? We can actually describe the position of two points or a point. And after that, if you're given two points, we can find this distance, right? And after that, if you extend this, let's say, not one dimensional space, if you talk about two dimensional space, again, by drawing two lines, we can form our coordinate system, right? We can describe the relationship between any vector, so who are living in the two-dimensional space, uh, we can describe them using geometry. And also three-dimensional space, since we are living in three-dimensional space, but beyond three-dimensional space, it is almost not possible to describe geometrically. At that time, actually, algebra comes into the role so that using algebra, we can actually, how to say, travel to different dimensions using algebraic tools. So in our study of vectors, we have already encountered all of the concepts in this section informally in chapter one and chapter two. Here we will start to become more formal by giving definitions for the key ideas. As you will see, the notion of a subspace is simply an algebraic generalization of the geometric examples of lines and planes through the origin. And here, Pay attention, we are just saying the origin, not any line, but actually it must pass through the origin. When you talk about the subspace, because that, when you talk about subspace, soon you will see that it must contain the zero element. So the fundamental concept of a basis for a subspace is then derived from the idea of direction vectors for such lines and planes. The concept of a basis will allow us to give a precise definition of dimension that agrees with an intuitive geometric idea of the term. Uh, yet it's flexible enough to allow generalization to other settings. You will also begin to see that these ideas shed more light on what you already know about matrices and the solution of systems of linear equations. Um, anyway, a plane through the origin in R3 looks like a copy of R2. So we will see actually in our first example, if you just visualize that, let's say R3 and draw that, um, what is that R3 plane here, right? And we are talking about this three-dimensional space. This one is X1 and X2, X3. So if you draw a plane that passes through the origin, right? and it looks like exactly a copy of R2, two-dimensional space. Two-dimensional space is that thing, right? It is X and Y. And anything we can do on this plane, actually, also we can do on the subspace. Actually, I'm not, uh, maybe I can do something like this. It's a plane passing through the origin. Okay. 
So anything that passes through the origin. Also, you can like, if you just pick two vectors, I can add them. And also, if you pick two vectors on this plane, we can add them, we can subtract anything I can do here, and also I can do here. So we may also say that any calculation that can be done with vectors in R2 can also be done in a plane through the origin. So we say that like R2, a plane through the origin is closed with respect to the operations of addition and scalar multiplication. Why? Because here, right, if you just pick any two vector, let's say if you pick one vector and we have another vector. If you add these two vectors, we will have another vector in this plane. If you separate these two vectors, we get another uh, vector in this plane. Similarly, if you're talking about this plane that is passing through the origin, right? If you just add two vectors, so it will be here. It's not somewhere else. Or if you subtract two vectors here, again, it will be on this plane. And that means that anything we can do here, actually we can do the same operations in this plane. So when I say just close means that you're not just, uh, how to say, uh, if you just add two vectors, we don't get any other vector which is not in this plane. So what are the vectors in the plane, two or three dimensional objects? Now, if we may just argue that, for example, let's say we're talking about one vector here, if I pick another vector that is on this plane, let's say. So this vector and this vector, okay, here this vector is living in two dimensional space. How about this vector? Is it a two dimensional object or three dimensional object? But actually, it is two-dimensional object, but it's living in three-dimensional space. It has, of course, it is three-dimensional because it has three components, right? But it is something like living. Um, so how to say this? It's like um, they are three-dimensional because they live in R3, and therefore they, they have three components. On the other hand, they can be described as a linear combination of just two vectors. When we just talk about dimensions, you will see that the important thing is not the components. Using how many vectors we can describe this vector. Using only two vectors, we can describe this. That's why it is three-dimensional, but actually it is, um, what is it? It is just, we, uh, to describe this vector, we just need only two vectors. Anyway, so actually we are going to talk about these things in this section. Before I start this chapter, I just want to remind you about this stuff. We actually studied this in chapter one, that was theorem 1.1, that is algebraic properties of vectors in Rn. When we talk about a vector space, okay, we have a kind of space here, and let's say this Rn, n dimension space, that means that each component here, Maybe you can take one vector here, u, another vector here, v, and we have infinitely vec many vectors, right? And when actually we just call this a space, if the space is closed under these operations, how many operation properties here we have? Eight. Number, uh, the first one says that if you just pick two vectors in the space, if you add them, right, it must be here, and uh, u plus v equals v plus u. If you just you add u to v or v to u, it must produce the same thing. And uh, the second one is u plus v plus w equals this, all right. And three is, this zero means that we have, actually the space has zero element here. If you add it to any vector here, the result is the same vector. That is u plus zero vector equals u. Here, I'm not trying to show that if you just add zero to u, it is u. Okay, we are show, trying to show here that such element exists, that space contains the zero element. So that actually, if you add this to u, I mean here by this, we are just uh, giving information about the property of zero. If you add it to any vector, the, uh, the result is the vector itself. And also for every vector, we can find another vector. We are just denoting by minus u. And if you add them, that's equal to zero, zero vector. And we have this property and this property. And also we have one uh, element here, identity element. If you multiply by any uh, vector by one, it's just equal to you. It's not actually here, but it's a scalar. Scalar, if you multiply one by you, that's equal to you. Anyway, when we talk about space, vector space, we mean that these operations are possible to perform in this space. 
Okay, now let's actually start with this definition. So now we are talking about the space, right? All this property, I mean, the operations were possible. So what we mean by subspace of Rn? So subspace of Rn is any collection S of vectors Rn. So any collection means maybe one vector, two vectors, and three vectors. So zero vector zero is in S. Number one, it must contain zero vector. And two, if u and v are in S, then u plus v is in S. That means that S is closed under addition. Okay, that means that here we are talking about the kind of vector space. Let's say this R n. Okay, so when we just say this vector space, immediately have to think of these properties. Actually, all these properties are uh, how to say are. I mean, all these properties work in the space. So here again, we are talking, actually when we talk about subspace, we are talking about small space living in Rn. Okay, we are talking about this S. So here we have, let's say, also a lot of vectors, maybe infinitely many. For example, again, if you are talking about, let's say, two-dimensional space, let's say this line passes through the origin, that is the subspace of this two-dimensional space. Okay. Why? Because it has zero entry, right? It's passing through this. If you just pick two vectors on this line, add them, it gives us another vector on this line that is closed under addition. Because if you just pick any two vectors, let's say the first vector is this, and second vector is this. If you add this, you will get another vector on this line, not somewhere else. And if u is in S and c is a scalar, then c times u is in S. That is, S is closed under scalar multiplication. Okay, if actually these conditions are satisfied, then we say that this S that contains a bunch of vectors, it is subspace of R. That means that it is a kind of space living in this space. Okay. All right, first, just to get, uh, how to say, to feel more comfortable with subspace, let's back to your questions. The first example shows that every line and plane through the origin in R3 is a subspace of R3. Okay, every line and plane through the origin. Actually, here we have two questions, right? And uh, um, the first one is, you can talk about the line, every line and plane through the origin in R3. So if we just answer the first part, let's say the first part is line and the second one is plane, okay? So that is the first part. And now we have to show that every plane that passes through the origin is a subspace of R3. What does it mean? It means that, let me just say subspace, it satisfies those three conditions, okay? So how do we do that? We know that if you're talking about a line that passes through the origin, right? Uh, to actually draw a line, we know that we need two pieces of information. Number one is we need a direction. Number two is uh, a fixed point, actually. It gives us a location, okay? It's passing through which, what point? Since it's given that it's the origin, let's say this passes through this point, zero, 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 that's the origin. And the direction vector is, let's say it is V, right? Now what will be the equation of this plane then? The equation of this plane will be, what is it? That X is equal to, here we have K, or I can just write T maybe. It is T times V, right? That is the equation of a vector. And of course here this X is, what is X? Its coordinates are like this because we are talking about three dimensional space x1, x2, x3. And uh, how about v? It is a direction vector that is v1, v2, v3. So now we need to show that that is the, the this line is a subspace of R3. So the first one, <clears throat> what is the first condition? The first condition says that we need to show that it contains zero, right? So that means that here, because t is any real number here, right? If t equals zero, right? So the x will be zero times v, which is equal to zero vector. 
right? So actually, this belongs to that line. Let's say that line is L. Okay, the first one is done because we know that since it passes through the origin, that means that the zero, the point zero belongs to this line. Second one is if you pick any two vectors lying or living in this space or living in the line. Let's say if you just pick any two, U1 and U2, that is on the line, right? Since that is the equation of this line, it must satisfy this equation. That means that at X, right? equals t times u1, right? And also that x equals t times u2, right? These are these two vectors. So now I have to show that actually also this layer sum actually is on this line. How do we show that? So here we have t, uh, t times u1 plus t times u2, right? So that is t times, all right, u1 plus u2, maybe t1, t2. Okay, no, I should not like it like this. Okay. I mean, since the equation is t times v, that v is fixed vector, right? Any two vectors that is in line, actually, it must be given like this. So u1 must be t1 times v, and u2, the second vector, is t2 times v. So when the scalar change, right, it produces different vectors. So now I have to show that also the year sum that your sum is u1 plus u2 belongs, belongs to this line. That is t1 v plus t2 v, which is equal to t1 plus t2, that's equal to v. And we know that the sum of two real numbers against another real number, let's just label this by t, and here we have v, right? It's exactly this equation. Well, that means that also this belongs to L. So that means that, also, it is closed under addition. And third one is, now we have to show that if you just pick any C, a real number, right, and multiplies by V. So we need to show that, again, it belongs to this space, subspace. So how do we show that? Here we have, let's say, if you just take any vector that's given by T, V, right? If you multiply by C, that is C, U, which they call the C, T, V, and this is vector, actually it's a vector. This is scalar, this is scalar. What is the product of two real numbers? Again, it's a real number. So I can just label this by something, let's say T1, uh, let's say V, right? And here this vector is multiplied by just some kind of constant here. Because this T is any real number, it is one of them. Also that means it belongs to L. So now we have shown that actually it satisfies all these three conditions. That means that every line that passes through the origin, that is the subspace of, what is it, R3. Okay, it is a one-dimensional object, but living in R3. In similar way, we can show that also for the plane. Okay, should not touch the tablet. Right. But here, instead of this TV, we will have two components, because we know that how to write the equation of a plane. So that's passing through the plane, uh, the origin. Then what is the equation of that plane? It will be that x will be equal to c1 times u plus c2 times v. So this u and v are direction vectors for uh, this plane. But here we are talking about the line, so we have only one direction vector. But for a plane, we need to have two direction vectors right? because it's a two-dimensional object. And everything is the same, but instead of his T1V, here we will have T1U plus T2V. And I'm just, if you multiply or add the same thing in a similar way, you can just prove this. Okay. All right. So the method of the previous example actually, 
can serve as a template in more general settings when we generalize the previous example to the span of an arbitrary set of vectors in any Rn. The result is important enough to be called a theorem. And then what we have done is, is just for a, a line, and also in a similar way, we can do this for the plane, but for in general, actually, if you are talking about some different things, let's say if you have three or four or five, in a similar way, we can just actually prove those all theorems or facts as, uh, to be subspace of Rm. So here it says in this theorem that v1, v2, vk, you are given k vectors in Rm. And it's saying that if you just take the span of these vectors, it's always a subspace of Rm. That means that it always satisfies those three conditions. Okay. So here we, again, to just visualize this, we're talking about Rn, that is Rn, we have maybe infinitely many vectors, and each vector has x components. And we are just talking about, let's say, a bunch of uh, k vectors here. Here we have v1, and here we have v2, and v3, and blah, blah, blah. And if you just consider all possible linear combinations of these vectors, right, and they form a subspace of Rn. And when you just say the span of this, this v1, v2, vk, what do we mean by this? And we know that by, um, by, okay, where is my pencil here? By span of v1, v2, dot, 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 and here we have vk. What do we mean by this? Actually, these are all, possible linear combinations of these vectors, right? Actually, what does this C1, C2, CK, any real numbers? So number one. Now first, I had to show that the span of this one, I can just denote this by maybe S, I had to show that this zero has, uh, belongs to this space. That means that S contains zero element. How do you show that? I see that if I just take all these coefficients, the C1, C2, and the CK, since these are arbitrary constants, so if I just take them as zero, right, at the time here we will have zero times V1 and plus zero times VK, and which is equal to zero vector, right? Since the span of this one, right, it is S, so that means that, this is satisfy this equation, that means that, what time can I? Okay, I better use red. I don't know, I cannot see the head of this. Okay, so this belongs to S. So that means that S has zero elements. Number two is, if we just pick any two elements, let's say here we have U and V, okay, S. Now we have to show that if we just multiply them by some constant, and also it belongs to S, that means that here, that is A times U plus B times V, right? So that is the second one. What is A times U? Any vector can be described by this, right? So that is uh, actually in this way, we are pro pro um, proving second and third. Let me just prove one by one. If we just do vectors, I have to show that U also plus V belongs to this set. What is U? Actually, U is the vector in S that can be expressed as a linear combination of these vectors. So that is, here we have C1, what is it? V1 plus C2, V2 plus, and here we have CK, VK. And how about this V? V is also another vector taken from this S. Since it is in S, also actually we can express this as a linear combination of these key vectors. So here we have V1, V1 plus D2, V2, plus dot dot, here we have VK, VK. So now, if we add actually corresponding entries or vectors here, here we have V1, V1, right? So it's a common vector. So I can just write it as C1 plus D1. These are scalars and here we have V1. In a similar way, we can add all of them. And the last one here, we have CK plus DK, DK, and here we have VK. Okay. 
right? And if I just relabel these coefficients, because this is the real number, the sum of two real numbers, it gives it another real number. Let me just denote this by, let's say not E1, um, maybe I can just use K1, here we have V1. Okay, V1 plus K2, here we have V2, plus dot 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 plus K, okay, K, here we have K, and here we have VK, right? So that is also a linear combination of these factors. That means that also it belongs to S, because any vector that can be expressed as a linear combination of these V1, V2, VK, they are in S. And number three is, how about if you multiply, and if you just pick any vector from S, now we have to show that C times U is a vector, and also it belongs to S. Right. How do we show this? Here, if you just uh, pick any vector U, so the vector U, C times U, and C times what's vector U, it can be written as this, so the C1, V1, plus dot 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 plus c k v k and if you just multiply by c it's the constant c times c1 v1 plus dot dot plus c uh, c times c k c times c k and here we have v k again by relabeling this this one as let's say d1 this one is the dk d1 d2 dk and here we have d1 vector v1 plus d k v k and it's just a linear combination of these factors it belongs to s so that means that all these three conditions are satisfied that means that the span of any k vectors if you just take in rn that forms f subspace so now actually uh, we will refer to span of this v1 v2 v k as the subspace span by v1 v2 v k vectors in our next video, we'll continue from where we stopped. Let's have some break.